infrared spectroscopy and wave numbers. We will perform a few calculations, theoretically speaking, to see roughly where absorption of infrared light will take place based on the type of bonds that we have in our organic molecules. And this starts with the idea that when you have organic molecules, you're going to have covalent bonds. And there is an equilibrium distance that separates these two atoms, you know, and that's what we equate to the covalent bond. Now, if you plot the energy of the, your system versus the distance between these two atoms, you get something known as the Morse potential. And there is a preferred distance, which is the equilibrium distance, the one that you observe experimentally, R sub O. But the idea right here is that the bonds are not really static. They can vibrate. They can uh, compress themselves to smaller values, in which case the energy goes up based on this curve, or they can expand themselves, making the distance larger, in which case you also, you know, get a higher energy. But altogether, you get this particular um, look to the function. And generally speaking, what this says is that if you try to compress the atoms so that they basically fall on top of each other, the energy is going to shoot up to infinity because now you're putting nuclei on the same spot. And you're, you're in essence trying to put positive charge onto positive charge, which is going to take quite a bit of energy to accomplish. And if you keep stretching the bond farther and farther away, at one point, the atoms are so far away from each other that you basically broken the bond. And when the bond breaks, this is what we equate to ionization energies. All right, so there is an upper limit to you know how far apart they, these bonds can be. But within this extreme, you have allocated bond lengths that can actually take place just because of the bonds absorbing infrared light and they're stretching and compressing values, right? Stretching frequencies, that's what we call them. Now, what you see right here, these levels, these quantum levels, V equal to zero, V equal to one, two, three, four, five. These are the infrared absorption uh, quantized levels of energy. And when you go from V zero to V one, you absorb, you absorb some amount of infrared, infrared light. When you go from V equals zero to V equals two, you absorb some amount of infrared light as well. So you have a unique set of ways in which a molecule can actually absorb infrared light. And that's what we're gonna utilize to ultimately identify molecules and you know, look at an infrared graph. Um, so it has a lot of power, really. But the first thing that we need to address is the, the calculations that go along with this thing. So the quantum mechanical framework for the most potential is given by this equation, where V bar is once again the wave number so in per centimeters, and this equals one over two pi c, where c stands for the speed of light, which is 2.998 times 10 to the eight meters per second, although we will change this to centimeters per second. Um, k is the force constant, which tells you, you know, how strong is your bond. And generally speaking, single bonds are weaker than double bonds, which themselves are weaker than triple bonds. So you have this value, of five times 10 to the fifth for single bonds, and then twice as much for double bonds and three times as much for triple bonds, which, you know, roughly speaking, represents the strength of single to double to triple bonds respectively. And then mu right here is the reduced mass. The reduced mass as an equation um, is the mass of the one component, you know, the one atom, the blue atom, times the mass of the second atom divided by the sum of the masses of the blue and the red atom together. This is the reduced mass. All right, so it's mass of atom one and mass of atom two, making up that covalent bond. So we're going to utilize all of this to calculate the wave number of absorption that we would expect for a type of bond. And we're gonna start kind of simple. We'll, we'll perform the calculation for the carbon-hydrogen bond. This is a single bond, and um, in terms of calculating the equation, we start with this. The very first thing we need to do is calculate the reduced mass. And 
you start ultimately with the mass in grams per atom. And I'm going to show you the proper way of doing this, and then I'll show you a simplification, which will make the entire calculation a lot more cut through and to the point. But we're going to start from, you know, from the very beginning, and we're going to do it the long way first. So the mass of carbon, I'm going to only use uh, the whole number, so no decimals. Uh, carbon 12 has a mass of 12 grams per mole. Right, so this is the fraction we're dealing with in terms of the mass. What we need to do is convert this from grams per mole to grams per atom. And in order to do that, we need to use Avogadro's number as a conversion factor. So notice that I've placed the atoms on the bottom because the one mole equivalent has to be on top so that we cancel out those moles in the equation. And performing this calculation will give us the mass in grams per atom, although I'm just going to write grams here for simplicity. So this is 19.9 .9 times 10 to negative 24. If we do the same thing with the hydrogen atom, the mass of a typical hydrogen atom is one gram per mole. And dividing this by Avogadro's number cancels out the moles, gives us grams per atom, which in the case of hydrogen is 1.66 times 10 to the negative 24 grams. So then what we do is we take those masses per atom and we plug them into the reduced mass equation. So we have the mass of hydrogen times the mass of carbon divided by the sum of the masses of hydrogen and carbon together. So what we end up getting for the numerator is 33 times 10 to the negative 48 out of this multiplication. And when we add these two numbers together, we end up with 21.6 times 10 to the negative 24. If you carry on the division, which at this point I highly recommend you use parentheses since you're dealing with exponential numbers, you're going to end up with 1.53 times 10 to the negative 24. Okay, so we're going to use that volume. I want to plug it into the equation. All right, so notice that we are dealing with a single bond, so we only use 5 times 10 to the fifth for the value of k. Uh, we already calculated the reduced mass, which is 1.53 times 10 to the negative 24. And notice that the value of the speed of light has been changed to 10 to the 10th because we want this to be in centimeters. Okay, so dividing 1 by 2 pi and the speed of light in centimeters per second yields a value of 5.31 times 10 to the negative 12 inverse centimeters. And what I've basically done right here to save me a little bit of trouble, although you don't need to do it this way necessarily, you could absolutely divide 5 times 10 to the fifth by 1.53 times 10 to the negative 24, get an answer, take the square root of that. Um, and you could do it that way, absolutely. Uh, but what I've done right here is I factor out the 10 to the negative 24. I've taken the square root of that and I simply divide the exponent by 2, right? So 10 to the negative 24 becomes 10 to the negative 12 outside of the radical and it still remains in the denominator. So notice here that you have 10 to the negative 12 on top and 10 to the negative 12 on the bottom. They're going to cancel out those two exponents and you're going to end up with 5.31 times the square root of 5 times 10 to the fifth divided by 1.53 which equals 3.27 times 10 to the negative 5. If we take the square root of that number we get 571.8 and finally, multiplying that to the 5.31 that's outside of the radical, we get 3,036 inverse centimeters. So what this tells us is that if we have a carbon-hydrogen bond, we expect it to absorb light roughly in the vicinity of 3,000 inverse centimeters. But now I'm going to show you simplification. So technically speaking, the equation requires you to convert this to grams per atom. But that means that you are going to divide the atomic mass in the periodic table by Avogadro's number. So let's input that symbolically. We're dividing 1 gram per mole by Avogadro's number. We're dividing the 12 grams per mole of carbon by Avogadro's number, right? So if we input the reduced mass in this symbolic way without actually using the value of Avogadro's number, what this technically equals is, well, 1 times 12 is 12. Avogadro's number times Avogadro's number is Avogadro's number squared. And on the denominator, we have 1 over Avogadro's number plus 12 over Avogadro's number. They have equal, equal values in the denominator, so you can add these two fractions as such, in, and you get 13 divided by Avogadro's number. Now, here you have 
fractions of fractions, right? So you have extremes multiplying each other, middles multiplying each other, and just as importantly, Avogadro's number cancels out once, right? Because this is squared, this is to the first power, so you can cancel them out. And what you end up with is 12 divided by 13 times Avogadro's number. And 12 divided by 13 is simply 0.923. Okay, so I'm going to use this entire segment, 0.923 divided by Avogadro's number, as the value of the reduced mass. Okay, so now we bring that onto the equation. We still plug in 5 times 10 to the 5th for the force constant. We still plug in uh, the value of the reduced mass, which in this case is 0.923 divided by Na. Or, if you just reassemble everything so that you only have one fraction, Na divided by 0.923. You still have the speed of light as 10 to the 10, 2.998 times 10 to the 8, to the 10th. Um, so what we're going to do right now is take the square root of just Avogadro's number. So take the square root of 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, and you will get 0.776 times 10 to the 12th. And now this is outside of the square root. And so what happens is that notice here that you have 10 to the negative 12 now being multiplied by 10 to the positive 12. So guess what? Those two values cancel out. And the 5.31 ends up being multiplied by the 0.776, which equals 4.12. But when this happens, when basically we factor out Avogadro's number, we've multiplied that resulting value by pretty much a constant because 1 over 2 pi times the speed of light is always going to be a constant. That's never going to change. And Avogadro's number, when you take the square root of it, is never going to change from this value. So in essence, what we've just done right here is shown that if you just get rid of Avogadro's number entirely from the equation, you're going to end up with this constant of 4.12 on the outside. And on the inside, you have the force constant the same way as it is. And for the reduced mass, you have the value that you would have gotten if you just kept the masses of carbon and hydrogen in terms of grams per mole and you get the same value so the beauty of this is that instead of having to change the masses to grams per atom forget about Avogadro's number simply input grams per mole into the masses of the two atoms so use 12 for carbon use 1 for hydrogen calculate the reduced mass based on just those two numbers so 12 times 1 divided by 12 plus 1 and you'll get the 0.923 and this is this is very simple to carry out as far as a calculation goes, and you get the same value. All right, so you'll use this equation in the future for this type of calculations. Now, the last thing I want to mention to you is that when you perform calculations for the different bonds, you now you can have the CH bond for which we use the calculation, we get 3036. You could do it for the NH bond, the OH bond, this carbon-carbon uh, single bond, carbon-carbon double bond, carbon-carbon triple bond, and so on and so forth. And the one thing you're going to see is that, and you know, unsurprisingly, for the double bond and triple bonds, the values are going to change a little bit, right? And the thing is this: the heavier your atoms are, the lower your value is going to be. So if you look at the carbon-carbon single bond, which has a value of roughly 1,200, compared to the carbon-carbon double bond, the value is now higher, right? And it's higher because the value of the K constant is, in fact, higher for double bonds. So that's not all that surprising. And it's roughly in the 1,700 vicinity. For the triple bonds, when you do the calculation, we get a value that is roughly in the 2,100 vicinity. And we're going to observe those values in a little bit when I show you the graphs. But when you compare the carbon-hydrogen single bond to the carbon-carbon bond, you see that the carbon-carbon single bond is lower in value, or by a lot, in fact, than that of the carbon-hydrogen bond because we have increased the mass by quite a bit, right? If you compare hydrogen to carbon, the discrepancy in the mass is a factor of 12. So you see a decrease in that respect. But the other thing that you also observe is that based on this equation, we will predict that oxygen-hydrogen bonds, nitrogen-hydrogen bonds will have values lower than the carbon-hydrogen bond based on the idea of the mass being higher, right? The mass of nitrogen and the mass of oxygen is higher than the mass of carbon, so you expect this value to decrease. 
but the problem is that this equation does not take into account electronegativity and the more electronegative your elements tend to be and the greater the electronegativity differences between your two elements the stronger your bonds going to be so this equation by itself is only good for non-polar bonds like carbon carbon bonds carbon hydrogen bonds and as such i would recommend that you only stick to using only um, this equation for non-polar bonds okay so that's just uh, my two cents on it okay in the next video we'll start looking at actual infrared graphs and we'll we'll equate them to the actual molecules so see you in the next video